بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to Talking with Teachers. I'm your host, Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali. Uh, this is the broadcast of the Lampus Education Initiative. And today, alhamdulillah, we have one of our special guests, one of our elders, uh, who many of you may be familiar with. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick. Uh, the Sheikh himself, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick, is a Muslim scholar and historian of Muslim West Africa. He holds a bachelor's degree from the university where the Islamic University of Medina, which completed in 1979, becoming the first American graduate from the university. He also holds an MA and PhD from the University of Toronto. His thesis was an analysis of the life and writings of Sheikh Osman Danfodio, a great West African scholar, warrior, and social mm -hmm. activist. Uh, he has lectured and taught in 61 countries and has also served as an imam, teacher, counselor, and media consultant in the USA, Canada, South Africa, and the West Indies. He is currently the senior lecturer with the Islamic Institute of Toronto and the outreach coordinator with the Council or the Canadian Council of Imams. He is also the history department head and the lecturer at El Madrid Institute and advisory committee member at International Open University. Um, many of us, of course, have benefited from the Sheikh uh, through our youth. Uh, I remember him from when I was very young. Uh, he was one of the uh, most prominent scholars uh, in the, in the English-speaking world at the time. And of course, um, there have, since then, a lot of new people have um, appeared on the scene, you know, but of course, he's continuing to do his great work. So we'd like to welcome to our screen, uh, Sheikh Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah wa Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. By the grace of Allah. Yeah, alhamdulillah, it's really an honor to have you, um, and uh, and thank you for agreeing to this uh, this broadcast, this podcast, um, and um, I hope that the bio was up to date. Uh, I sort of uh, altered it a little bit, sort of condensed it. You know, there's a lot more I could have added, uh, but um, I just wanted to make sure that everything is accurate there. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, um, what I usually like to begin with with my guests is a a question with relationship to uh, your background, right? So, so I typically like to ask the question of like, who is Abdullah Hakim Quick? And what I mean by that is, you know, um, what is your journey? What was your journey? You know, that, what, you know, your family background. Uh, how did you become a Muslim? Um, you know, what made you Muslim, et cetera, things like that. You know, so um, why don't you fill us in on some of those details? Because many people may not be aware. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to be Muslim and to be able to witness what is happening in the world and to be part of the movement uh, of Islam. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and I grew up in the turbulent 60s. In terms of my own background, um, I'm an African-American, and my mother's mother came from the island of Barbados in the Caribbean in 1917, and she mm -hmm. married an African-American. Oh, okay. so, so there is a Caribbean connection there in terms of my family, but I never understood much about the Caribbean region until later on in life. Mm. Um, I'm basically uh, Afro-American raised in, you know, in the Boston Mm -hmm. uh, area on my father's side, he's he's Afro American. Uh, it is said that his mother was a full or part uh, native mm -hmm. uh, from the Mohawk Nation. So, so our family is sort of a combination of things. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a housing project, uh, three story housing project. Mm -hmm. But it turned out it, it it's a part of Boston, which is across the bridge in a, in Cambridge. So Cambridge is in between. MIT and, and Harvard University. Mm -hmm. So I had sort of a dual type of life. I was living in the hood um, in the sense of, you know, going through the rough life of, of, of living in a tenement. But at the same time, I had access to our community center uh, to scholars uh, from MIT and Harvard University. And they were spending time, you know, with the, the, the youth uh, to try to upgrade uh, the lifestyle. So I was exposed to a lot of things, the anti-war movements, mm. um, education, and I, I was fortunate enough to do well in school. 
Hmm. And when I I went to school in Cambridge High in Latin, which is a, this is a famous school, you know, there in Cambridge, and um, I was I was the captain of the basketball team, and mashallah. Hmm. Um, well, alhamdulillah, you know, I was um, I was an honor roll student all the way through, mm -hmm. and um, although I came from a tough background, you know, I was offered a scholarship by what was then called National Negro Scholarship Foundation. This is mm -hmm. when they were giving scholars, to, you know, uh, scholarships right. to black students. Mm -hmm. And I took it, and I ended up in Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I stayed there for a year, um, and then I switched to Reed College. And Reed College is in Portland, Oregon. It's one of those high-level um, schools like Swarthmore, Antioch, Oberlin. And so they gave me a full scholarship. I was in Reed uh, College there, and it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So it was in 67 when San Francisco State, you know, blew up with the, the, the struggle for black awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, we formed Black Student Union, and we seized the building uh, there in Reed. And we, we stopped traffic. We stopped life. And we were able to get a black studies program. This is the same time mm -hmm. in San Francisco State. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so from there, you know, I, I got directly involved in the black consciousness movement. Okay. And eventually, eventually I left school. <laughs> the problem with leaving school in the 60s, uh, right around that time, is that you get drafted. Oh, so, okay. so I was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. Oh, subhanAllah. And, and, and my father uh, was a veteran of World War II. Uh, he was actually in the military police. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had a tough time, you know, as a black soldier uh, going through Algeria and Italy and Germany. And, you know, he came back with stories of discrimination and racism. Mm -hmm. and, and and so when, you know, I, I was drafted, my father looked at me and I, I looked at the paper mm -hmm. and we both said the Vietnamese never did anything to me. Was. Mm -hmm. So why should I go fight them? Was this after Muhammad Ali's statement or before? Um, right around the same time. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I was independent of that because of the consciousness I had within my area. Mm -hmm. So I refused. And it was either six six years in jail, mm -hmm. you know, or I had to leave. So I made a type of hijra, a migration, <laughs> hijra siasia, you know, <laughs> right. migration. Uh, to Canada. That's the reason why I live in Canada. Oh, okay. okay. And um, but I was running from the war, and I ran into Islam. Mashallah. And it was there in Toronto. Um, you know, I was, you know, seeking something, a way of life, and mm -hmm. um, it was there that uh, I took shahada. There's a famous da'i, uh, Doctor Ahmed Saka, mm -hmm. the uh, very famous in America. He he was the one who gave me shahada. Mashallah. And mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. The journey then continued. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So, so the background is there. You know, I, 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 we've always been questioning our roots, questioning okay. our background, and mm -hmm. where we came from. And and from an early age, I began to study African history. My mm -hmm. passion is African history mm -hmm. because I want to know about my roots, and I want to make the connection between the continent, uh, mm -hmm. and between our life and what is actually going on. So this. Motivate, motivated me in the black consciousness movement. But there was something else. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go for the Marxist Leninism that mm -hmm. was happening out of the Black Panther Party and you know many other groups that I was associated with because um, my mother was a religious person. And so I grew up with a belief in God. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the revolutionary movements, although they had activism, they didn't have spirituality. Right. And so I, I left the, the consciousness movements and then went north. And alhamdulillah, uh, I, I embraced this one. Mashallah, subhanAllah. Yeah, subhanAllah. I appreciate the story. Um, it's, um, it's always nice to hear uh, about, you know, the journeys that many of our scholars have been on, because I do think it, 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 it creates a different type of respect Right in the minds of the people, and because you come from a time, of course, you were my elder. I mean, you, I mean, you became Muslim. Were I think I was seven when you became Muslim, right? So, I uh, was so very young, and so I, I miss all of those things. And and people, I, what I do understand is that, like people really don't understand 
you know, how difficult it, it would have been for people back in your time. You know, now you can be drafted and, and then taking a very courageous stand. Uh, and it's really nice to know that because um, we all are, we all know the story of, of, of Muhammad Adi, rahimahullah, you know, but, you know, to find out, of course, we also have others in our community who had took a similar stand, not necessarily because of Muhammad Adi, but, you know, around the same time as well, um, standing up against injustice. Now, you mentioned that your mother was religious, and so you didn't mention anything about your father. I'm assuming that your mother was the one who raised you, uh, you know, so she was a Christian, and, you know, so you said you were sort of raised in a religious family. And, you know, what did that sort of look like? You know, when you say religious, what do you mean by it? Well, she, she was a Baptist and an Episcopalian. No. So every Sunday, she used to go to church and take us to church. Mm -hmm. But my father was skeptical. You know, he had come out of the war and had a very tough life. Mm -hmm. uh, so he didn't go to church, you know, with us. Uh, he had his own way of looking at the world. Uh, but really, it was um, that spirituality uh, mm -hmm. of the Creator. And I used to pray the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. you know, but I couldn't accept the church mm -hmm. because rising to the Episcopalian level, um, there was class divisions uh, mm -hmm. between the people. And of course, Jesus Christ, you know, as a white man hanging on the cross, uh, was something that I couldn't accept. Mm -hmm. um, and so I left the church, mm -hmm. but I still had this uh, consciousness of God. Mm -hmm. it was, and it was my father, really, that, you know, gave me part of my revolutionary spirit. Mm -hmm. And he used to go across the bridge to Roxbury, and he was a welder during the day and a hustler at night. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he lived the street life in Roxbury and... Uh, from an early age, you know, he brought the book message to the black man. Oh. Know, okay, then he put it on, you know, on our house. I used to look at Elijah's face all the time. Uh -huh. um, but that was all. Yeah. I had no connection, you know, with Islam. I was in the revolutionary movement. And when I did finally come in contact with the nation of Islam, I mm -hmm. couldn't accept uh, Yaqub's theory of all right. mm -hmm. the creation of the white man. And, you know, I, I couldn't accept that because my area was predominantly black, but there was also poor whites, you know, and mm -hmm. Spanish uh, in the area as well. So I could not accept uh, their theories, although I did like the discipline, you know, and the organization, you know, and the respect for women. And yeah. it was when I went to Canada and then came in contact with the mainstream Muslim community and then read the Quran myself, mm -hmm. then I realized that this is what I need. Yeah. This will answer my questions and it gave me a world view because I was looking for a world view where I could still have my social activism um, and at the same time I could believe in the creator and I could look at the world uh, mm -hmm. and, and have a sort of way to approach uh, life, way to approach things in the universe and and Islam was just checking all the boxes uh, and alhamdulillah um, I didn't look back yeah mashallah yeah. Yeah. You sound a little bit about, like my mother, Rahimahullah, when it comes to the nation of Islam. And but she was probably the more skeptical of my two parents when it came to certain things. She was much more, at least with what she told me herself, you know, that she was much more into the the group unity and the overall message about, you know, social uh, up, uplift and fighting oppression than she was about, you know, the ideas, uh, you know, the Aqid itself, right? You know, so uh, my father, although I never heard him state that he he believed in the uh, the theory, the Yaqub, uh, the, the, the creation, the theory itself, uh, but he was much more of a true believer from, from when I, I gather, you know, that he, um, he really hated for people to talk negatively about Elijah Muhammad uh, and it took him some time for him to sort of work a lot of the things out of his system. You know, he literally believed, he told me he literally believed that he was the messenger of God, that God, the creator, sent him to, to earth, right? You know, so he was uh, uh, a bit le less skeptical than my mother, you know, so, 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 okay, so you flee to Canada. I mean, so did the government pursue you right, the, the, after that? And you, you got, of course, you've been back to the U.S. since those, those years <laughs> in the past, I uh, were they pursuing you or did they did they eventually they yeah. dropped it? Yeah. Well, you know, th 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 there was a, a sort of a compromise made with the Canadian government. Okay. Uh, where they allowed draft dodges um, to come over, not deserters. 
Mm -hmm. There's a difference between somebody who joined and then ran, mm -hmm. somebody who refused. So, mm -hmm. so I would be in the category of the war resistance. Okay. And uh, fortunately, when President Jimmy Carter uh, came in, he promised to pardon the war resistance. Oh, okay. So I was pardoned. I uh, was sent a letter from the State Department, you know, that, that I could return, you know, which I did and, and continued on with my citizenship, uh, you know, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was resolved. But by that time, I was in Canada. I got married. Mm -hmm. I was part of the Muslim community. Uh, and so, you know, I didn't really look back in the sense mm -hmm. of, living in America, because Canada, in a sense, had become my home. Okay, right. So you found Islam. Okay, so you see, so you, you're fleeing from the U.S. government, you find Islam in Canada. Of course, you mentioned you were raised religious, Christian, Episcopalian, um, you know, your father's a skeptic, you know, so what, what, what about Islam? Was there something that actually stuck out something particular that drew you to the Quran itself or drew you to the message itself that made you say, you know, this is the truth, right? You know, I know I was raised this way, but, you know, I think this is actually actually, actually the truth. You know, it it, it really was the, the personality of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that attracted me, his balance and, um, you know, his spirituality, yet his social activism, uh, at the same time, his revolutionary nature, but, right. but kindness to his family. Mm -hmm. you know, it was that kind of a balance, really, that um, pulled me, you know, mm -hmm. toward uh, Islam. And, of course, that direct relationship with Allah. Because I, I was confused with the Trinity concept and mm -hmm. with Jesus as a white man. Uh, but right. this, this answered my question. Though. This is like straight Tawheed, straight right. monotheism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which I was I was looking for without the superstitions and without you know, all the different confusions, the Christmas, the Halloween, you know, the madness, you know, that was in our culture. Mm -hmm. This was straight uh, belief in the creator and a viable way to live, mm -hmm. a viable way to be productive in society, to raise my family, because naturally, um, because of the one of the effects of slavery is that, you know, we lost our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we lost our ability to really see ourselves, you know, in a sense, um, as productive, you know, citizens connected to Africa. We mm -hmm. lost our right. roots. You know, so this was it was giving me the root in right. terms of connecting me with um, the whole of the Muslim world, and again connecting connecting me with Africa as well. Right. So I think that probably is a pretty good segue into your writings, right? Because I mean, of course. Perhaps the most popular uh, book you have is the uh, book Deeper Roots. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and what uh, the t the subject of the book is and what really uh, your goal was in writing that particular work? Well, the Deeper Roots really is more than just uh, words on paper. Mm -hmm. The Deeper Roots really is an experience mm -hmm. because I, I was searching for, for for my identity, for my roots, going into uh, history and, you know, and then, you know, listening to the stories and, you know, watching the Roots movie program and whatnot. So this is called Deeper Roots. Right. Mm -hmm. This is not superficial African culture. Mm -hmm. But what is deeper in African culture that, that, that can connect me to the, to the lifestyle? So I wanted a true African lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was... Um, after I had graduated from Medina, alhamdulillah, back in 1979, and I came back for one year, I was in Los Angeles at Masjid Mu'min, uh, teaching, and then uh, four years, you know, in the Caribbean and Jamaica, teaching, you know, and I traveled all throughout Central America and Caribbean islands, you know, then I was back in, in, in Toronto. And so, but it was in, in, around in 1987 uh, that, um, there was a big conference called Islam in Africa Conference. Mm, okay. And so this was held in Abuja in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they had invited the top scholars from all sectors of, 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 of African Muslim experience. Mm -hmm. And they needed somebody from the Americas. So they invited um, Imam Warath Dean Muhammad, Rahim mm -hmm. Allah, mm -hmm. uh, to represent America. Mm -hmm. They had heard about my work before. 
through my contact with some of the Muslim uh, African students. And so they invited me, in a sense, to represent the Caribbean region. Imam Ward al-Din could not come, so I represented the Americas. Mm -hmm. And this conference had everybody. It was an amazing conference. It had the leaders of the Salafi movement called the Izala movement, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mahmoud Umi. Uh, it had uh, 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 Rashid Ganushi from mm -hmm. Tunisia. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it had uh, 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 Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh, the great mm -hmm. scholar of Burnu. Mm -hmm. um, it had, you know, the, the leaders of the Qadariya Tariqa, the Tijaniya Tariqa. Mm -hmm. You know, it had the main scholars in Africa, East African scholars, South African scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it was um, an amazing thing for me as a student of knowledge. Uh, to feast my eyes upon this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, that's where I wrote my paper. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to show mm -hmm. uh, the presence of Muslims uh, in the Americas. And I had been doing some research. Right. And I realized that Muslims were actually in America before Columbus. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, who was one of the leading Afrocentric scholars from Guyana, Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. And we had a, we had a conversation and he encouraged me because he said that, um, you know, he went into the writings of, of the West Africans who crossed the Atlantic before Columbus, but mm -hmm. but he couldn't read Arabic. Oh, okay. But like, you can read Arabic. Right. Mm -hmm. Go into their writing. Take it a step further. Mm -hmm. well, that was a great encouragement. Sure. And, um, was he Muslim? No, he wasn't Muslim, okay. but, but he was open-minded. Mm -hmm. he, he was very neutral. He wasn't extreme like some of the other Afrocentrics making crazy statements, you know, about Islam. Mm -hmm. um, he was respectful, but but no, he wasn't uh, no. a Muslim. So therefore, I did this paper, you know, outlining the presence of Muslims in the Americas before Columbus, during the slavery period, uh, and then also showing indentured labor period and other things that happened in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And I set up a stand there. Mm -hmm. and I had pictures of Muslims from all over the Caribbean, you know, there and, you know, this discussion. And so uh, it, it was amazing because they had these chains, the chains of Nupeland. These, these are actually slavery chains. And it was downstairs and everybody was amazed. So, so, so the leader said, why don't you take the chains and put it in front of your stand? Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with Muslims in a slavery period. So I lugged the chains upstairs, mm -hmm. put it in front of my stand, and they say that after the flag of Sheikh Osman ben Fodil, which mm -hmm. had been brought back from the British, and was the most important artifact in the whole conference. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to see these chains. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so all of the scholars were coming upstairs, mm -hmm. and they were meeting me and um, looking at this, and heads of state, and uh, it was an amazing experience. And so that paper that I gave, uh, had an impact because w when I came out of the room, at, at one of my, one of my friends, a Nigerian brother, you know, he said to me like, "What did you say to these people?" And I said, "Well, I just gave my paper." I said, "Why are you asking?" And he said, "Because they came out the room crying, uh, mm, tears, mm. because they never knew what happened to their brothers and sisters right. uh, when they were sent overseas mm -hmm. or captured." and taken as slaves. So you were like filling in yeah. all the history. And Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh, mm -hmm. great scholar of Bordeaux, one of the greatest scholars, you know, maybe in West Africa itself, he mm -hmm. told me personally that he had read the writings of Al-Masrudi, Al-Idrisi. Right. He knew about journeys across, <clears throat> but he never knew what happened. Right. Mm -hmm. He said, like, you're filling in this information that was unknown to us. Uh, so, this, so this gave me encouragement. Mm -hmm. And then in, in 1992, um, when it was, they, they called it the, the, the quincentenary, 500 years of voyages of discovery, mm -hmm. uh, I was part of a team, an anti-Columbus team. Mm -hmm. And so we traveled across the Americas, uh, giving lectures at universities and in communities to show that Columbus did not discover America. But he was actually lost, and he bumped right. into America on his yeah. way to India. Right. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah. so therefore, so what I did was I, I consolidated this mm -hmm. and I put out a small, you know, book, uh, which had a big impact uh, in the community and rapidly spread, you know, and then later on, I revised uh, the work and I'm in the process now of a third revision uh, of the book. Alhamdulillah, Allah bless me. You know, it was sort of like a fruit, of, you know, these years of going in communities and, and laboring and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. I was approached by Bursaka, which is the research center of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Mm -hmm. And they approached me because they wanted to do a, a conference on Mus legacy and history of Muslims in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Because of the 57 states in the OIC, uh, Guyana and Suriname are represented, but nobody knows about Guyana and Suriname. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was traveling in, in the in Turkey, and they invited me to Istanbul. Um, if you know Istanbul, the Hagia Sophia and, and the Ottoman archives, this is where they have their center. And they said they were looking for somebody who could deal with Muslims in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And they went online, they Googled it. Mm -hmm. and they, they kept seeing my name over and over again <laughs> popping up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so fortunately, I took this, and alhamdulillah, they, uh, uh, they enabled me to be there, the, the envoy the official envoy of the OIC to the Caribbean and the lead scholar. Mm -hmm. And so um, in September, we pulled off after two years of work, we pulled off a major conference. The government of Guyana supported us and mm -hmm. we had scholars from all over the region uh, and different parts of the world who flew into Georgetown, Guyana. And we had this major conference this is just recently on, on the, the history and legacy of Muslims uh, uh, in the Caribbean region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is an ongoing work. Uh, alhamdulillah, I'm, hope, I'm hoping to put out, you know, a third edition, uh, which would be much better. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, so is this the, the the just the main work that you've been doing? So have you written any, uh, any other books or is this just really just the main project that you've been for, working yes, on? I mean, actually, you know, I, I am a graduate of Kulia Tadawa Wasulatu. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the College of Dawa, right? Mm -hmm. And Rasul. So, I mean, being a social activist, this is the basis of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, my mission in life is Dawa, and that is to spread Islam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And, and, and so I went out with that intention to spread Islam and traveled around to different places. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that, you know, if you put up a sign and said Islam, the misunderstood religion, uh, there would be a few people who would come. But if you said roots, African history, mm -hmm. you get a crowd. Right. So I realized, especially in dealing with African Americans and Hispanics to a great extent, mm -hmm. when you talk about history, mm -hmm. you have an opening in order to give dawah. Right. Right. And, and so, you know, really, I use the history, mm -hmm. you know, as a means of spreading uh, mm -hmm. Islam. And, and, and so while I was doing the dawah in the Caribbean and back up in the United States and Canada, Mm -hmm. uh, my passion uh, kicked in, and Allah was merciful, and I was able to enter University of Toronto on a master's level. Mm -hmm. um, and because I had met the scholars in West Africa, and I had deep connections, then I was put into a master's PhD program with the leading scholars of African history in the West. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Martin Klein, who was the head of the African Studies Association, you know, was my professor. Mm -hmm. You know, my thesis was which was was on the life of Chekhov's mm -hmm. folio. Mm -hmm. I had to defend it against Professor John Hunwick. Oh, I'm really? <laughs> John Hunwick of Northwestern. Mm -hmm. You know, he had the largest Arabic uh, mm -hmm. writing African uh, library, maybe in the whole of the West, outside of London itself. Mm -hmm. So I had to defend my thesis against him. Uh -huh. So, so this is the highest level of uh, African. Uh, our history, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, but because I was on the ground, mm -hmm. my connection was with the scholars. Mm -hmm. We had a love in our hearts for each other. Uh, and so they opened the doors for me. I literally went back as a master's PhD student into Nigeria. This is before cell phones and before mm -hmm. internet. Mm -hmm. And they opened the archives. Shekhov mm -hmm. Folio wrote 150 books. Mm -hmm. And so they literally gave me manuscripts mm -hmm. and I carried the manuscripts across the street and I photocopied them. 
<laughs> and and then a, a businessman from Kano, mm. Nigeria, he mm. paid to have them bound. Okay. And I brought back 37 original writings of Sheikh mm. and Fodio Rahim Allah. Allah. And, and this was the basis of my thesis. Okay. So how and, um, what 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 tied in with that is that um Sheikh Osman then Fodio, and I know we're going into another subject. So yeah. Osman, so we're working up to that, inshallah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I'll, I'll just touch on that. But Chekhov's mm -hmm. man, Denfodio, mm -hmm. he was actually in the first thirty years of his life, he was involved in Dawa. Mm -hmm. So he was calling the people. You could say Dawa wa Irshad. Mm -hmm. So he was guiding the people, giving them guidance, and calling mm -hmm. to Islam. And so that fit in with me. So all of the writings that I have mm -hmm. done uh, are based upon Dawa and Irshad. Right. It, it turned out that another one of my, you know, my most popular uh, books is a 40 hadith on Islamic revival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So literally what I did, I used the system of Imam al uh -huh. and <clears throat> I was traveling around to many different countries. And it was at the time, this is in the 90s, especially 80s and 90s, when there weren't many English speaking uh, lecturers who, who were trained in Islam. So therefore, you know, I was on the le lecture circuit with uh, Dr. Jamal Bedoui, Imam Siraj Wahaj. So right. we would get inv invited everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I needed some way mm -hmm. to condense, you know, uh, you know, this knowledge. I couldn't carry a lot of books like the Imam. Many people carry a lot of books. And I don't have a photogenic memory. Mm -hmm. So I went through all of my writings. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of Juma khutbas mm -hmm. and lectures to see if there were certain hadith that were repeating themselves over and over again. And I found about 40, 41 hadiths. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. sat with some scholars in Cape Town, South Africa, where I had moved to, mm -hmm. and I realized there was a method to this. Mm -hmm. It was Islamic revival. Okay. Mm -hmm. The bottom line in every community that I went to around the world was that. Muslims needed to revive their faith, tajdeed, right, al right. al The difference between, you know, my 40 hadith and some of the other classical ones, I was dealing with issues that confront us in the urban settings, hanging mm -hmm. on the corner, taking mm -hmm. drugs, right. uh, racism. Mm -hmm. so, so I was dealing with real live problems and then bringing... Um, authentic hadith, you know, to solve that that issue. And right. so these, this 40 hadith, really, it was selfish at first, because once I put it together, I could travel anywhere. <laughs> and, 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 you know, in just about every situation, I would have something to say. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Because one of these 40 hadith actually would be dealing with an issue mm -hmm. that people are dealing with on the ground. Youth right. situations, um, you know, all superstition and so many different things w w are in this set. So this became one of the more popular uh, writings here that I had along with okay. um, the 40 Hadith. I also, um, mm -hmm. I also did a translation and a uh, commentary on uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk's uh, oh, really? book, An Nasiyah to Kafiya Afia. Okay. Uh, um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf actually gave me this book many years ago when I visited his house. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, and you know, I took the book and I ran with it mm -hmm. because you know, again, it's um, it's 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 a it's a revival. It's a it's a way to to clean yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a world view, mm -hmm. and Sidi Ahmed, because of that encyclopedic mm -hmm. way that he approaches knowledge, right. uh, literally gives you a, a type of a, a blueprint. You know, where where you can deal with all aspects uh, of your life as a Muslim. Right. So I translated and, 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 and commented on that, and that, you know, sold hundreds of copies, you know, uh, as well, uh, and, you know, as another one. Another issue, you know, that, that many people know me as, know me for, is one called Holiday Myths. Because, you know, a number of years ago, you know, to deal with the street, to deal with child, youth, right. I was dealing with youth problems. And there was the issue of Halloween, Christmas, mm -hmm. Easter. So I did a lecture and I put it into a book form mm -hmm. and it spread like wildfire. Like mm -hmm. what is the truth about Christmas? What is the truth about Halloween? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the truth about Easter? 
That's called mm -hmm. holiday myths. And mm -hmm. that is also being revised. I'm in the process of revising all of my books now. Um, and put them in, in a different form as well. Inshallah. Allah continue to, to bring benefit through you uh, by all that and through your, your talks and your travels. Um, I wanted to, I mean, of course, I, I, I definitely want to give back to Sheikh Osman Danfodio, but I did have this sort of, this this um, somewhat strange question to ask because I was looking at what, what your Wikipedia page and and I had come across a mention about ISIS and them threatening your life, right? You had, and there you were on there listening on a hit list. And I was actually shocked to see that. I never knew that. Yeah. And I said, because I'm listening to you speak and I'm saying, well, okay, what could he have possibly said that would have made ISIS want to kill, take his life, right? You know, I mean, uh, what is your understanding of the, the reason for that? Like, why would they, did they want to, to, to kill you? This is very strange. And I, I never really understood why, you know, why. And ISIS itself, you know, is an enigma because in, in a sense, you know, it, it seems like it was actually made you know, and, you know, by non-Muslim powers, yeah. you know, as a means of destroying Islam. Mm -hmm. And so they were reaching out. They, they were targeting people in the West who were effective speakers like yeah, Dr. Yasser Qadi. Right. Mm -hmm. So and so I guess, you know, they targeted me because I said, you know, that um, Canada and the West, you know, is, is a reasonable place to live. We can practice Islam mm -hmm. here. Okay. So because I said that, and I didn't agree with traveling overseas to them, and, you know, they, they attacked. But I, I think it was because whoever's behind them, you know, mm -hmm. felt that I was too effective. I was yeah. affecting too many people. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to, you know, eliminate people who were effective in the West. Allah knows best. Right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right, so so if you've spoken a, a bit about uh, Sheikh Rahman Danfodio uh, already, you know, but... Uh, for for the for the sake of those who who don't really know much about him, you know, I, 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 why don't you give us a a brief introduction to him? Like, you know, well, where is he from? When did he live? Why do you can think that he's an important um, figure in Islamic history, a recent Islamic history in particular, and um, um, and why more people need to know more about him? Yeah, what I've been searching for. You know, and as part of the Irshad uh, movement mm -hmm. um, is to try to find balance. Because as a young Dai, I came into the field, I left the Caribbean, I came back to Toronto and I became Imam of the Jami Mosque, which at that time was probably the largest mosque in Canada. Mm -hmm. And all the schools of thought were there, all of the Islamic movements, everybody's in the room. Sufi, Salafi, Ikhwani, Tablighi, Everybody is there. How do you unite this community? Mm -hmm. And so I, I needed a balanced way, you know, to, to be able to approach all these different levels within Islamic society. Uh, and, you know, Sheikh Osman Danfodio was, was what I found to be that type of a, a scholar that Allah blessed mm -hmm. uh, to give a balanced approach. And it is rare that you find somebody who has qualities like him. Mm -hmm. As a young um, scholar, at 20 years old, he was considered to be faqih in, in, in Maliki fiqh. Mm -hmm. And he went into the field. And he reached a level of spirituality where the Qadiriya Tariqa in West Africa considered him to be a Qutub. They mm -hmm. considered him to be on the highest level of spirituality. Mm -hmm. So he was, in a sense, um, a, a very scholarly person. And within the first 30 years of his life, he wrote a book called Ihya al Sunnah wa Ikhmad al Bida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, which, you know, it, it is the you know, reviving of the Sunnah and the destruction of innovation. Mm -hmm. And if you read that book, it reads like a Salafi book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but literally, what he's doing is that he is rooting out the evils within Hausa land social problems, family problems. Um, you know, all the different issues and he's using Islamic scholarship in order to root this out. And he especially went against Bidda. So when he's using Bidda, he, he's not talking about it just in a theoretical sense, you know, of how you make Salat. He was talking about innovations in lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Very practical scholar that he was. Mm -hmm. 
At the same time, he reaches this spirituality, especially by the, by toward the end of his life, where he's considered to be the highest level of tesawuf. Mm -hmm. So, so it is rare that you find somebody, you know, who has the ability on both ends, and and actually, you know, refuses to be called the Mahdi, refuses mm -hmm. yeah. to you know to, you know to to be said that he flies to Mecca, you know, spirit spirit. He refused all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And and he focused his tasawwuf was a, was a sober form of uh, tasawwuf, and he focused on a tasawwuf lit tachaluk, and that mm -hmm. is for character. Right. And he would not introduce his followers to higher levels of spirituality until their character was developed, their fiqh was developed, and they were actually implementing spirituality in a life in their lifestyle in a practical way. Mm -hmm. I haven't found really anybody on the ground um, that I can access, you know, his life. Mm -hmm. Paul has wrote extensively about his life. Yeah. And, Are there you know, any? I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm sorry, Sheikh. Yeah. So, 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 uh, you know, I literally um, became his murid in a sense. I was following him mm. completely. And, the, you know, when they talk about his biography, he's a young man coming into the field at 20 years old. The scholars are there in front of him. And so what did, what did he do? He used to make two rakats, you know, and he used to make his intention. And then he would say, I would speak to people, whether it's common people, scholars, all the same, because I'm doing it for Allah. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. gave me strength to go out and face a thousand people on Juma. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All schools of thought, all nationalities, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to be able to bring that balance, right. you know, within his life. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, I focused on um, the, the the first part of his life. It, his life is in three sections. From 1774 to 1804, this is when he traveled, he did dawah, he, he, he taught. And, and so my thesis is dealing with social intellectual history. But mm -hmm. that's how you approach it as a historian. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he, he affected... The social intellectual history of the people of House mm -hmm. okay? But what he was doing, he was teaching the usul to the masses of the people, and he would talk to them in poetry in their languages. He spoke, uh, uh, you know, Hausa language, uh, Fulani for full day. He spoke Tamashek, the language of the Tawarik, mm. and he would do poetry uh, to the people on the streets. He was correcting bid'a in Hausa land. He was confronting extremism among the scholars. He was uplifting and educating women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was confronting power. Now, that's mm -hmm. something which is so relevant to us today on the right. ground. Mm -hmm. The second part of his life from 1804 to 1810, this is what he's known by the Orientalists as, because that is when, you know, he was traveling with a thousand students. And the corrupted kings tried to assassinate him, mm -hmm. made a type of hijra, a type of migration. They attacked him. He had a type of battle of beda, uh, you know, and, um, you know, a, a small group defeating a large group. And mm -hmm. they opened up 250,000 square miles. Mm -hmm. They governed them with Sharia for 100 years before the coming of the British. So this is not far away. Right. And that's the reason why the people of Hausaland remember mm -hmm. him up until today. Mm -hmm. The last part of his life from 1810 to 1817, this is really the expansion and consolidation, you know, of the uh, Khilafat, because they call their thing the, the Sokoto uh, Khilafat. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's when they, you know, consolidated. And his writings follow the different phases of his life. But in the last phase... He decided to leave the political part. And he said, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. Choose an Amir. Right. So they had Ashura and they chose his son Muhammad Bello mm -hmm. uh, to be you know, the leader of, of Sokoto. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and the Sheikh spent the rest of his life teaching. That's when he went to the higher levels of spirituality. Right. Mm -hmm. With specialized students. You mm -hmm. see? So it doesn't get out of control. Right. Where people are going out of Islam, outside of Islam with their spirituality. 
Mm -hmm. that, that's what he did in the last phase of his life. And he died uh, in 1817 at, at, at 63 years old. So, right. <laughs> right, right. He <laughs> sinned so much. He even died at 63 years old. Right. Yeah, that's probably the same as the prophet's wise to look, right? So there is so much to learn mm -hmm. um, from his life. Mm -hmm. um, so many. I implemented his life on the mimba, mm -hmm. literally. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's amazing. And, and by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, last year, uh, in uh, November, December, uh, I was invited to Sokoto. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, they have a, a yearly Usman Danfodio week. Oh. And this, this is the Sultan of Sokoto. Mm -hmm. it's the highest religious authority, you know, maybe in Africa itself. Mm -hmm. And um, he invited me personally to come because they had heard about the work that I did. Because the first 30 years of the life of the Sheikh, very few people have written about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they invited me, you know, to, 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 to do something, you know, to, to write about this and to write about the legacy of Sheikh's man in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, so Alhamdulillah, uh, it was a personal invitation from the Sultan. And I went to Nigeria and I delivered the keynote address um, with the emirs. Most of the emirs were there, government officials, mm -hmm. you know, uh, over a thousand people, students were there. Um, it was an amazing, uh, uh, you know, gathering. And I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after all those years of work, you know, that I was able to give back, uh, you know, to the society there, you know, and, and to keep his writings alive. Rasha Allah, Tabarakallah. That's uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Be beautiful. And um, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he eternalize the benefit uh, um, by both, of course, the Sheikh and then if you're, your your work uh, with respect to um, magnifying his accomplishments, his life. Um, I find particularly that, that uh, Muslims, um, of course, there's a movement to actually try to rediscover or to discover like some of the uh, different ways that Africans um, deal with uh, certain Islamic issues in the political realm right? Um, compared to the way that Arabs and Persians and mm -hmm. um, the others that they did, of course, the, uh, those in the subcontinent generally sort of uh, address them. Um, yeah. and, and it does seem like that there is something unique about in particular West Africa with regard to uh, the way that they themselves are able to harmonize with their people in their environment, et cetera, right? Now, of course, we see like Sheikh Osman Danfodi, uh, Danfodi was, was very much concerned about, uh, you know, heresy and, you know, of course, um, very uh, unpleasant practices in Hauserland. Um, but I, I had a question I was thinking, Okay, in what ways, if, if you're able, to, if you yourself, if you ever thought about this, I imagine you probably have, you know, in what ways was his movement different from the Mahdiya movement or the movement of uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad ibn, ibn Abdul Wahab, right, um, in the Arabia? Yeah, were there any ways that you say that it's unique, right, compared to, to those two movements? I would say that um, Allah knows best. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uniqueness is really based upon where it happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because these different scholars and activists, mm -hmm. they implemented Islam in their region in a mm -hmm. particular time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so Sheikh Osman Zenfodio in, in the uh, 18th century, 19th century, West Africa, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's implementing Islam, you know, there in Hausa land. Mm -hmm. And he has an impact, you know, on the region. The whole region is impacted. Mm -hmm. right. You know, by him. E e even you know, Hajj Umar Tal, you mm -hmm. know, who, who was like the founder of the Tijaniya movement, mm -hmm. uh, he actually, um, you know, was influenced by Sheikh Osman Danfodio. And you know, in one of his journeys, he traveled through Hausalan. He actually married the granddaughter of the Sheikh. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was influenced by him as well. Mm -hmm. This is what a lot of people don't realize. And but for me, what is the most important? What is different? is that you can see a complete picture. It's not somebody who just calls. He calls to the way, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. 
It's not somebody who makes grandiose plans. Well, the Mahdi he wanted to be the Mahdi. You know, he defeated the British, and you know, he, he's on his way to Mecca, and then he to be the Mahdi, and then he drops dead from typhoid fever. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't complete. <laughs> Okay, but what, what is beautiful about the story of Shekhoth Mehmed and Fodio is that it's complete in a sense that, that you know, he goes into the field, you know, he's doing Dawah and Irshad, he confronts the evil, you know, he's attacked, you know, he takes Be'ah, uh, Be the pledge, they form the community, they defeat their enemies by the power of Allah, they establish an Islamic state, mm -hmm. the Sheikh then spends the rest of his life comfortably teaching and raising his spirituality until he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, mm -hmm. so that is a complete picture. You know, mm -hmm. you can see different levels right. um, and, and actually some amazing things. I mean, for instance, I'll give you an example. In 1788, when the Sheikh was traveling around with uh, a thousand scholars with him, imagine traveling through the desert, savannah, with a thousand students. Mm -hmm. Everywhere he stops, that's his university. Mm -hmm. So the House of Kings became jealous, and one particular one, a uh, 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 king named Bawa, the ruler of a place called Gobea, mm -hmm. you know, they tried to uh, assassinate Shekels and Fodio, and it didn't work. And then finally, um, the Bawa, the ruler, said, okay, what is your demand? What do you want? Mm -hmm. I'll give you gold. And mm -hmm. said, I don't want your gold. Mm -hmm. So the ruler said, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think about our situation now to show yeah. you how this reflects. He said, mm -hmm. I have five demands. Mm -hmm. Number one, I want you to allow me to invite people to Allah in your land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Don't stop me. Mm -hmm. You know, from, 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 from calling, you know, to the message. Okay? No Islamophobia and all this. Right. Two, don't stop anybody who responds to my message from becoming a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Three, I want you to, 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 to treat every uh, person who has a turban on with respect. Mm-hmm. And I want you to respect women for women with hijab. Mm -hmm. Any woman who takes hijab, I want that them to have respect within your land. Mm -hmm. And five, mm -hmm. free all political prisoners. Mm. Now look at that. Think about our situation. Yeah. Think about Jamil, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Free yeah. all political prisoners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's dealing with Islamophobia. He's dealing with dawah. He's dealing with women's, you know, mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's dealing with, you know, you know, you know, political, you know, you know, issues, um, and mm -hmm. also within this, also too, there's another point too, you know, that, that I should add to it here, that he said, uh, and and this is an important point. So I want to correct this. Mm -hmm. The point about to treat every person with a turban, you know, and a veil with respect. We'll put that as one point. Mm -hmm. The fifth point is lift all unjust taxes from the people. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this is heavy because that's right. economic, right? Yes, right, right. And the Marxist Leninists would say mm -hmm. that, you know, the economy, that's the bottom line. It's mm -hmm. material things. Right. Mm -hmm. So, not only was he dealing with spirituality and Islamophobia, he was also dealing with economic injustice. Mm hmm. So, so this is a relevant right. uh, mm -hmm. scholar. Yeah, this very much. Yeah. yeah, I'm convinced. Yeah. You, know, you, you definitely convinced me on those five points, you know, about how unique he is and and um, how we need to have more understanding and knowledge of, 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 his, of his ideas. And, you know, it's a different paradigm for many people, for many Muslims especially. And, um, I mean, you made a couple of references to um, Marxism and, you know, the materialist that particular orientation, right? You know, the, uh, you know, both with regard to the black nationalists when you were coming up, yeah. uh, and then now also here towards the end, you know, um, uh, again, um, how much, and, I, and this is perhaps it, we, we moving towards wrapping up right now, you know, so, um, do you feel that that's 
that Muslims today, that certain Muslims today who are actually working in the area of activism, you know, also have been highly influenced by Marx, Marxist Leninist ideas and that self and that in itself actually is complicating their efforts. Definitely. I mean, you know, when I came up, you know, in the 60s, um, in the turbulent revolutionary movement, uh, we were influenced heavily by the left, what they call today the left. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so this is the revolutionary movement, you know, in a sense. But then we realized that, you know, even the left itself has its extremism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I found that, you know, they were, they had no spirituality, Mm -hmm. And they did not have a way of life, no morality. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the issues that our community faces. What is the relationship of male and female with our families? Mm -hmm. They had no morality. And now we see today, you know, what the left has actually become, right. you know, you know, in, in terms of morality and our children and, you know, whatnot, you know, so, 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 you know, we are influenced by this because it's, change we want revolution we want change but at the same time we need balance yes we're not really left we're not really right right we're in the middle mm -hmm. right we are the balanced nation mm -hmm. and, and this is what we need to have the flexibility mm -hmm. to be able to you know go to either side in a sense of gain value mm -hmm. you know from anybody but maintain our dignity and our faith mm -hmm to maintain our deen. This is not an easy thing to do. And it requires a lot of wisdom and a lot of shura, consultation right. uh, with each other and also benefiting. And I'm thankful to you for having this program with some of the elders, because I think one of the big problems uh, our, our challenges facing the younger generation is to benefit from, you know, you know, their elders. Right. This right. is something which historically, you know, Muslims have benefited from their elders. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have to invent the wheel but this new TikTok, you know generation you know it's like they you know they don't care they'll reinvent the wheel and mm. say i found it first right <laughs> you know, instead of gaining the wisdom of those you know who came before them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? and so really it, it is important to make you know the connection at the same time it's important for the elders the elders mm -hmm. um, you know like myself mm -hmm. you know to respect the, the, the movement the energy of the youth mm -hmm. You know, and their courage. You know, so we need to have a coming together of the two. You know, you know, to be able to form a a a, a dynamic, you know, movement, and to be able to reach out with each other more. You know, and and, and to sort of connect mm -hmm. uh, with each other. I mean, people for a long time thought that I'm living in Canada and like Canada's all snow, and you know, because I have a Caribbean background. Some people even thought that I'm not an African American. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, because of the Caribbean background, right? But if you look at Malcolm himself, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> you, know, this, you know, this background is there because mm -hmm. it really all is the same. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's which part of, you know, the, you know, Weston's slave trade did you land in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is the time of unity. This is the time of breaking down barriers. Mm -hmm. And this has been my mission in life to bring together. Uh, people, and I will work with you know the Sufi, the Salafi, the Ikhwani, mm -hmm. the Ligi. You know, Alhamdulillah, uh, Allah blessed me with the ability to go amongst all of the groups. Mm -hmm. You know, and and to not necessarily, you know, get a pushback except for the extremists. Right. Except right. for the extremists. So we need to have that balance. Um, and Sheikh Osman Danfolio is one example of that. Mm -hmm. There are other great scholars in Islamic history. Um, we need to, 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 you know, to really study this. I want to leave you with four points. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, and, and this is some interesting points, you know, sort of as so like a homework thing, you mm -hmm. know, that they can do. And it's coming out of the teachings of Sheikh Osman Dan Fodio. He said, four matters by which Allah will illuminate your heart with the light of faith. There's four matters. Mm -hmm. You can get into these matters. And this is important because, you know, many, many of us, we're, we're, we're finding um, we have the rituals, but we're losing our, our Iman. You know, we need illumination. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and this is what he said. Very practical what he said. Mm -hmm. Number one, cultivation of taqwa. Of course, the consciousness, the awareness of Allah. 
and, and of course, taqwa, that goes real deep. And that's into your spirituality. Cultivate your taqwa. Number two, sustained study of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. You are studying it not just for tilawa, but you are going into its, its reflection, what is the meanings, and a sustained study of the Qur'an. Three, a, a, a deepened study of the sunnah and sirah, the biography of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mm -hmm. He's saying, spend time on the sirah, because mm -hmm. that is living Islam. People right. think about, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching to new Muslims now. I'm teaching a course right now, you know, on uh, pivotal moments in Islamic history. And, you know, if, if you think about what's happening, you know, with Palestine, study the Sira, go to the Khandaq, go to the Battle of the Trench, and, and then you will see Meta Nasrullah, mm -hmm. right? We have examples, living examples within the Sira. Mm -hmm. And four... The Sheikh said, study the biographies of the people of the past. Mm -hmm. Rightly guided caliphs, the Sahaba, the founders of the Madhabs, mm -hmm. the pious people, and others who have made an imprint on history. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is an approach you know, that, that I take. Uh, you'll see that in the Islamic Institute of Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see me focusing on this, bringing out history, to gain the guidance from the living experiences of the Muslims that we can use that today and not to cut off from the past. Don't get lost in the past, but but use history as a means of uh, uh, illuminating our lives today. And we're talking about ilmu nafia. We're talking about beneficial knowledge, you know, that can help us in the struggles that we are going through today on the ground. So, mashallah, beautiful Shaykh. May Allah preserve you. Um, where can people follow your work? Yes, um, I entered um, reluctantly the world of Facebook. You know, when internet came in, you know, I thought it was like taking off your clothes in public. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but I entered it. But then I found after traveling around with Al-Maghrib Institute mm -hmm. and other groups that I was with, mm -hmm. that um, you know, when I said something, people in other places could actually benefit. Mm -hmm. And so now, if you go to my Facebook page, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick, mm -hmm. that's my Facebook page. I have 748,000 followers. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick, public figure. And you can follow along there. Secondly, my website. That is Hakim, www.hakimquick.com. So there, you can actually purchase my publications. Um, I'm now putting out the second uh, edition of Sheikh Osman Denfodio. I put it into a book form uh, in the heart of a West African revival. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to put out, it's sold out, and, and I'm putting out a new edition of it. But you can get the deeper roots. You can get 40 hadith, Sidi Ahmed Zadruk, holiday myths. Uh, that's my website, hakeemquick.com. There's also um, a YouTube page, Abdullah Hakim Quick on YouTube, because I'm, I have a lot of lectures from over the years, 40 years of lectures come pop up all over the place you know, in YouTube, which is to our benefit. And sometimes, you know, it, it attacks us because we're talking you know, what we said 40 years ago. And they okay. said, you just said that now, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so they hit you with that. Yeah. YouTube is another way. Mm -hmm. And then also Instagram, mm -hmm. Abdullah.quick uh, on Instagram. Uh, you could follow on the Instagram, you know, as well. And the Islamic Institute of Toronto, uh, I have a series of courses that I ran over the last nine years. And their website is www.islam.ca. That's an easy one. Mm -hmm. Islam.ca. And so there you can get my courses. You can literally <clears throat> download the courses. I have a 32-part uh, course on fiqh sirah, the understanding of the sirah. Also, the liar prophets, um, and and many different uh, topics. You can download, uh, and you get courses there. <clears throat> From my website, you can get some courses I did. I have one called um, 
African Sunrise that deals with Islam in Africa and deals with Chekhov's Mandan Folio. It's a course that I did. Uh, there you can actually you can, you can download download that. Um, I also did one on uh, Muslims in East Africa, the early uh, spread of Islam there. I called the Empire Strikes Black. Right, so you can get that one as well. Uh, <clears throat> and then one dealing with the Black Muslim experience. So you know when the George Floyd uh, phenomena happened. Um, I also did a course right during that time when it was hot, you know, dealing with blackness from early Islam and then dealing with the Sahaba, you know, who were black, rearranging our understanding of Aswad, what it actually means, mm -hmm. that it's not weakness, it's actually power, mm -hmm. it's Sayyid, Siyada, mm -hmm. or rearranging our understanding and then taking uh, a step further. I want to add something on that people can actually access immediately. Mm -hmm. That's a special gift that I'm giving to you. <laughs> I made um, two documentary films. When I was living in uh, Cape Town, we took a film crew with South African Broadcasting into Ethiopia. And we went to the grave of Najashi. Mm -hmm. I filmed uh, and it was shown 12 times on national TV. And it's online. It's called Un Untold Ethiopia. Mm. Untold Ethiopia. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can download it tonight and you can see a journey into Ethiopia. Um, I go from Addis Ababa. I go to the walled city of Harar. Harar is a very famous city. And I go to Nagash, where the grave of Najashi is. And 15 Sahabas are buried there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and tell that story. And then there's another one. We took a film crew into Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And so it's a journey. It's called Empire of Knowledge. Mm -hmm. Empire of Knowledge, Timbuktu, and put in my name, Abdullah Hakim Quick. You can download that tonight and you will see a journey into Timbuktu. This has become a historical experience because this is before the extremists hit uh, you know, Timbuktu and started destroying books and everything like that. So mm -hmm. I go to all of the major archival centers. I, I speak with the imams of the masjid. Mm -hmm. I actually filmed inside of the uh, Jingadi Bear Mosque. Mm -hmm. It was impossible to take a camera inside of there, but the sheikh allowed me. So mm -hmm. Timbuktu, you get a journey to Timbuktu. And you can download that tonight. Uh, and you can watch that uh, as well, along with the other uh, YouTube programs. Mashallah, there's so much, so much to to learn and to benefit from. And uh, Mashallah, and of course, over a, a career of 40 years of, of da'wah, of course, naturally, we would expect something like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Shaykh. Uh, may he continue to grant you well-being and good health. Um, keep your mind fresh, <laughs> you know, and keep you uh, coherent. Um, you know, so we really do appreciate you taking the time out. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, and um, hopefully this won't be the only time that we have such a conversation, you know, but, the, but hopefully this is just the start of multiple conversations that we can have about multiple topics, you know, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Thank you for coming. And um, inshallah, um, hopefully uh, have you uh, with us once again, inshallah, very soon. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and Spotify. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. God willing. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.